It's historic. We had every Democrat, every Republican, Assembly and Senate, our conference committee, represented by Democrats and Republicans from both House, everybody unanimously agreeing to restore the cuts that were being made to Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. I just can't, I just can't understand, because even in the conference committees, I asked a simple question. Governor, people on the Budget Committee, have you ever fed a person who couldn't feed themselves? Have you changed a diaper? Do you know how to do a feeding tube to a child who can't be used, can't feed himself? Are you aware of how difficult life is when you're challenged? How difficult is it for your families? I'm going to just say something to you because it's part of my life. We were blessed with a special child. And you know, he was almost four years old. Beautiful baby. He was so good. He doesn't speak, he didn't cry, and he smiled. And all of a sudden, my wife, who was a nurse and a very loving, loving person, said there's something wrong. And the, the pediatrician said, well, he'll outgrow it, it'll come in time, he'll be, maybe he's a late developer. But Ellen knew. So we went to the doctor. He had a club foot, developmentally disabled, profoundly retarded, couldn't speak, and couldn't cry. What's best for us to do? Well, Ellen, there's two, th in those days, it was Wasea or Willowbrook. So you have to give your child to other people in an agency to take care of your child. And then they said, you know what? The child is here 24 seven, we have care, we'll take care of him. What happened? Please don't come here for six weeks because he has to adapt to the environment. Six weeks later, we go there, Ellen goes there, and she sees her child, lost half his body weight, had a black tongue curled up. The only food he was getting was other residents feeding him whatever was there. <laughs> took him to a pediatrician, took him home to make him well. Took him to the pediatrician's office, and the pediatrician cried. He cried. How in the world could something like this happen? He looked like he just came out of a concentration camp. And that's what the state provided in the care of people. And then you looked a little research and you found out, short-staffed, not enough training, but this is the best that we could do. Well, it became a revelation, and we know the history of this, and we may move forward and we improve. But when you hear the term short-staffed, because after we had Ricky there, we took him to the, and he was brought back to decent health, good health. Once again, you have to go through that process. Allegheny Valley School in Pittsburgh, a fellow by the name of Prince, involved with the Pittsburgh Pirates, set up a house for special needs children. He was there, short-staffed. What happened to Ricky? He was put in a scalding hot tub, scalded, burnt, at 106 temperature, and almost died. Why? Short staff. Training, the needs for the direct care, professional service people, just isn't there. It's so hard. Well, we'll talk about them in a minute. Okay, where did we go from there? Well, we went from there to Long Island Developmental Center on Long Island in Huntington. Nice people, dedicated, professional, direct caregivers, short staff. And then being there and knowing the staff and what is taking place on nights, because I knew Jill McGinn, may she rest in peace, who was the regional director, it's all about dollars. You had two wings, 12 kids, one person on the night tour. What happened? The kid got a head caught, died. A head caught between a bed and a wall. What happened? Nothing. What, did you ever hear about it? No. Staff was told if you open your mouth, you're gone. So they didn't say anything. Cause of death, unfounded. Another situation just brought to view to me again. An assault, blood all over the floor. A, de a blind girl was assaulted. Seen, they called security. What happened? Security came, cleaned up the room. If there wasn't all kind of bloody pillows that were there, they never would have known what happened. It would have been unfounded. So instead of calling the police, they called security, who cleaned the room, which was the crime scene. What can you do about that? Nothing. Why? Short-staffed. Who's in charge and who cares? Well, this is a mentality that has taken place. 
Now we go a little bit further, and here I am with the Carey family, with Michael talking about Jonathan, watching a, a pattern of behavior. Huh, look at this. It's Wasaic all over again. Parents told, he's going to be here. You don't come back. You're, uh, you're interrupting his, his care. Don't be here for at least three weeks. No, behind behavior management, took his food away, took his clothes away, put him in a dark room, and I see this, and I'm, I'm, I have a horror. I can't sleep thinking about what's happening. I get a phone call on President's weekend after we drafted legislation to do something about this. Michael was killed with a one-on-one, -on -one, the safest thing you can have, a direct caregiver with a person, with a child, with a resident. By the way, they were called consumers, which was really upsetting. But here's what happened with Michael and with Jonathan. He was restrained and he lost his life. Then we find out the man who was in charge worked 10 consecutive double shifts. He's in jail. The kid is gone. Did we learn anything? That's 40 years after what took place with Ricky, and it's still there. And what is happening today, because as late as last week, three incidents on Long Island of, of assaults and what is taking place. It's something that is so common in our, in our state facilities. I mean, the state oversight and the ability to really have oversight to make sure the health and safety of our children are there. And we're going to say, we're going to cut staff. We're going to cut dollars. Dollars or people? And the answer really is, it costs money to be able to have people. You got to train them. You got to prevent these situations from happening. You got to spend money to do what is best to prevent, to provide a hate, the safest environment. And you have to be able to have people that can't and do not have to work enormous hours. I want to share this with you, and I know this as a fact for almost 50 years. Every one of those direct caregivers are working 16 hours a day. If they're working in a facility, they're working in a hospital. And I want you to know, because we passed many bills. I passed dozens of bills saying that you have to have a one-on-one, -on -one, a, a parent advocate to go to a hospital or an emergency situation so somebody's there to speak. If you don't have a child that speaks, the first thing they do is they restrain them. Now, I had a parent who came who was a doctor and their child, they restrained the child. He doesn't know what's going on. He's a person. He has feelings. He had a seizure. He didn't know what's happening. I went to a dental appointment. You know what? Ricky wasn't cooperative. Why? What happened? Well, let me go. I go, Ellen and I go. What do they do? Ricky has no teeth. You want to know why? The acid reflux from not eating, he developed a habit of regurgitating and the acid ended up having to take his teeth. So we only could have puree food. So he has to have a dental exam by law. Okay, what do they do? I go there, guy puts on a rubber glove, restrains Ricky, and I said, what the hell are you doing? He's gonna put his hand in his mouth. I said, what are you doing? Talk to him, he's a person. He has intelligence, he has feelings. How would you feel sitting in that chair and some guy gonna put your fist in your mouth? Well, oh, oh, take your fingers. Oh, okay, done. So we have to educate. We have to make people who take care of our children. When you have a short staff and you have what they call floats, people that don't know your children. Now, if your child doesn't eat right away, he doesn't know who you are. You don't talk to them. You're going to feed them. He turns his head and say, well, we don't have time. Let's go to the next child. How many children don't get fed? Just recently, I was there. Ellen and I were there. They didn't have enough people. Kids are sitting there, nobody to feed them. When they, Ricky was in the hospital two weeks ago, we had three special children there. We had one person that was going to take care of the three children. But when they brought the food, there was nobody to feed them. Short staff. Governor, Governor, you're taking money away from this budget to take, I mean, and you think this is going to get this money from administration? I mean, don't you understand the consequences? I invite you, Governor, I invite the people on the budget to do me a favor. Come, come with me. Come to a house. Come to a group home. See who the children are. Talk to the people that work there. You're going to get an earful of dedicated people, our direct care service professionals. I want to ask you, how many people here are going to tell your children, hey, listen, when you grow up, I want you to be a direct caregiver? Are you kidding me? The lowest job, the highest, the hardest, the most difficult. You're dealing with human dignity and respect. You have to be a special person. And I just don't understand if we don't pay people like this. Where are our values? Are they upside down? Are we talking about dollars here and minimum wage here and the difficulty of training and the obligation and responsibility? I want you to know a person of color takes Ricky Christmas time. Ricky's spending a 
Christmas with a, a, a person of color, got to be <laughs> right in, in your, your expression, a black lady who loves Ricky, and she's with their family on Christmas, how they love our kids and they take care of our kids. That person isn't there. Who's going to take care of him? Somebody's going to come and they don't know him. And they don't know that he, does, he has a problem. You have to eat. Slowly, you have to eat. And I'm going to share something with you. I'm supposed to be at Stony Brook Hospital tomorrow but with Ricky. You know what's happening? This is very personal. I want you to know. Because I want you and everybody else to know. This suffering, if you don't have care and the dollars to provide the care, Ricky can't speak. He can't cry. You know, he has severe gastronomical. He had endoscopy and he had you know, everything else for his digestive system. He had surgery to wrap his intestine around his stomach so he can't bring the food up. Ellen was doing six washes a day. This is her child, her baby, her love. And look what we went through. So we had that surgery at Stony Brook, fine. But now he's in pain. And he's in pain and he can't talk. So what is he doing? He's hitting himself. And you know what? He's hitting himself because he can't express his feelings and his pain. You know what has happened? He took the hair off his head. It looks like a landing strip on his side from hitting himself. He can't talk. Who's going to take care of this child? Well, the only people that take care of him are the direct caregivers who can speak, who knows the child, knows their needs. This is what's important. This is what I want people to experience. You do not. I never heard of anything like this as an elected official my whole life advocating. Even Newsday, the wonderful paper on Long Island, wrote an article. Does Assemblyman Wiesenberg spend too much time advocating for the disabled? That's the sensitivity that we have. I mean, I want to tell you, it's really upsetting. What happened here tonight was a great learning experience for me because I want to say this to you. We're not done. We're not done with this fight. We're going to utilize everybody who spoke here today, all of us together, to make the governor aware of the responsibility and the consequences of taking money out of this budget. The money is there. We put it in, in the assembly budget. The Senate put it in, in their budget. Bipartisan. What happened to that money? It was there. Now it isn't there. And when you talk about negotiations, it's very upsetting. I spoke to every, every senator, every assemblyman, every Democrat, every Republican. You know it. We're all in favor of it. Well, let our voice now unite together, and let's, the only way we're going to have success is to educate and make the governor aware, make him sensitive to understand, make everybody who's involved sensitive to understand the quality of life, the dignity and the respect, and the relief to families. And we have hundreds of thousands of people that are being impacted by these cuts. Their voices have to be heard. By the way, that's an expression that was given to me many years ago. You're the voice of those who have no voice. Well, that's an obligation and responsibility, but now it's ours. You said it, you feel it. God bless you and I thank you. We're one family here. Together, we will have success. And I thank you.